In September of 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, officially starting a war that had actually been simmering underneath the surface of European peace for many years. While the fighting in Poland was dramatic and drew the attention of the world, it wasn't actually the first fighting in Europe that was the result of Nazi territorial ambitions. Little remembered today is the fact that the first fighting against Axis powers in Europe occurred six months before the invasion of Poland, and not far from the Polish border, a part of the world that has had many names historically, including the Republic of Carpatho, Ukraine. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The area known as Subcarpathian Rus, Carpathian Ruthenia, or Carpathian Ukraine, is a small region that sits south of the Carpathian Mountains in Eastern Europe. It became part of the Kingdom of Hungary around the year 1000. The name Ruthenia is a Latinized form of Rusin, the term for the ancient Rus people of Kievan Rus. Many medieval European sources use Ruthenia and Rus interchangeably, such as in a 1520 treatise with a chapter titled about Rus or Ruthenia. A Danish diplomat titled his memoir of a journey to meet Ivan the Terrible in 1578, Voyage to Ruthenia. Ruthenia also referred in various ways to parts of modern-day Belarus and Ukraine. Eastern Slavic peoples in the region that became Ukraine continued to call themselves Rus throughout the Middle Ages. The ethnonym Ukrainian didn't become popular until after the 1880s. Over centuries, Ruthenia began to refer to a smaller and smaller area. Russian or Ruthenian was a common term in the medieval era for all Eastern Slavs, and within the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, only to Slavs living in what is now modern Ukraine and Belarus. After the partition of Poland in 1795, it referred primarily to Ukrainians who lived under the Habsburg monarchy. By the end of the First World War, Ruthenia referred only to the region in Hungary south of the Carpathian Mountains, and the people that lived there. The end of World War I brought significant territorial changes. One of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points was the peoples of Austro-Hungary have the freest opportunity to autonomous development, a goal which demanded the dissolution of the dual monarchy. This dissolution allowed a number of ethnic and regional groups to gain independence, including Czechoslovakia, which would include the region of Carpathian Ruthenia. Ukraine and Belarus would be split between Poland and Soviet Russia in the Treaty of Riga in 1922. Ruthenian leaders had negotiated with Czechoslovakia for autonomy within a future state. The Paris Peace Conference also specifically stipulated that Subcarpathian Rus be granted full autonomy in an assembly for self-administration. The Czechoslovakian Constitution of 1920 did not fully grant the region autonomy, but promised it would come later. No assembly for the region ever met, and complaints about autonomy remained a persistent source of discontent within the region. Major political movements in the region included Ukrainophiles, who supported greater autonomy or a union with Soviet Ukraine, as well as Russophiles, who emphasized the region's cultural and historical connections to Russia. Relatively few in the region supported the status quo under the Czechoslovak government. Despite the restrictions, the period was relatively good for the region's culture, as they were allowed to speak their own language and control schooling and theater. The rise of the Nazi regime in Germany sparked concern in Czechoslovakia. In the late 1930s, the country built extensive defenses along the German border to deter invasion. In March of 1938, Germany annexed Austria, leaving Czechoslovakia nearly surrounded. Next, Hitler sought the Sudetenland, a region of mostly German speakers in Czechoslovakia along the German border. Diplomatic negotiations were held between the UK, France, Germany, and Italy, ending with the September 1938 Munich Agreement, which handed the Sudetenland to Germany. In Czechoslovakia, the agreement had another name. The Munich Betrayal. Neville Chamberlain announced from 10 Downing Street that for the second time in our history, a British Prime Minister has returned from Germany bringing peace with honor. I believe it is peace in our time. It didn't look that way to the Czechs. The country lost its expensive fortifications, as well as many of its factories and heavy equipment. Czech refugees swamped what was left of the country, fleeing from German occupation. Subcarpathian Rus in the far eastern part of the country was spared territorial loss at first. Following the loss of the Sudetenland, Poland occupied a small section of the country that had been contested between the two nations. The Czechoslovakian Republic tumbled into the second Czechoslovak Republic, and Slovakia and Subcarpathian Rus declared autonomy as part of a newly organized country. Simultaneously, the Czech government sought to stave off invasion by becoming German-friendly. The country banned the Communist Party and suspended Jewish teachers. As part of the Munich Agreement, territorial demands by Hungary were also promised a resolution. In October of 1938, Hungary attacked Czechoslovakia several times, forcing arbitration that included representatives from the central Czechoslovak government as well as representatives from each autonomous region. Germany and Italy arbitrated, ultimately awarding parts of Slovakia and Subcarpathian Ruthenia to the Hungarians in the First Vienna Award. 
In November, a new government was elected to govern Ruthenia, led by Ukrainophile Prime Minister and priest Augustin Voloshin. Ruthenia also formed the Carpathian Sitch, an irregular paramilitary force. On December 30th, Subcarpathian Rus renamed itself Carpathian Ukraine. Tensions in the region remained high in the early months of 1939. Hitler planned on invading Poland, but wanted to neutralize what was left of Czechoslovakia first. In a series of diplomatic meetings with autonomous Slovakia, the German government made it clear that Slovakia's only chance of autonomy was to declare independence and leave the remnants of Bohemia and Moravia to German ambition. In Ruthenia, the Sich had around 15,000 members, although only 2,000 of them were organized to fight, and an even smaller number were actually armed. At the time, foreign observers thought that Germany meant to create a greater Ukraine that would have itself started the Ukrainian-leading Ruthenia to goad the USSR. Ukraine was a serious topic at the time, with one Canadian scholar calling it the greatest unsolved problem in nationality, while well, a letter to another newspaper called Ukraine the forgotten nation of Europe. Ukraine was always a central part of Hitler's territorial plans, as he hoped for it to be the breadbasket of his empire. The Toronto Daily Star quoted Hitler as saying, what we could do if we had the Ukraine. One paper even reported that 100,000 German troops were ready to fight to prevent Poland and Hungary from crushing Carpatho-Ukraine. And indeed, in the fall of 1938, the German Foreign Office had instructed two researchers to analyze the issue of Carpatho-Ukraine, who advised making the territory into a mecca of Ukrainianism. One of the principal opponents to the scheme was Poland, whose significant Ukrainian population was even then crossing the border to join the Ruthenian Sitch. Polish and Hungarian agents began slipping into the country to sabotage defenses. While the world wondered, however, Hitler had made his own decision and iced out pro-Carpatho-Ukrainian advisors. Hitler prepared to invade Czechoslovakia on March 15th and gave Hungary permission to invade Ruthenia. In February, Ruthenia nonetheless attempted to get German promises of assistance and instituted a single-party system under the Ukrainian National Union Party. The Ruthenians had few friends and were instead surrounded by enemies. Poland and Hungary against an independent Ukraine and Hungary for territory. The USSR, just as hostile to Ukrainian independence, and Germany, the only country among them that could offer any guarantee of autonomy. Instead, Germany allowed Hungary to blockade the tiny region. On March 14th, Slovakia declared independence and immediately asked for the protection of the German Reich. The following day, German forces invaded Bohemia and Moravia, facing almost no resistance. The Hungarian army was ready to invade Carpathian Ukraine and began marching into the country in the early hours of March 14th. The Sich, whose effective forces might have been as many as 5,000, faced possibly 10 times that number and were poorly armed. Sich units began arming themselves from Czech barracks and Czech soldiers objected. At 6 a.m., Czech forces attacked the main Sich bases in the Carpathian capital with around 200 troops, six tanks, machine guns, and mortars. Fighting between the two forces lasted throughout the day. 40 to 150 Sitch troops were killed, while 7 to 20 Czechoslovakian soldiers were killed. Meanwhile, the Carpathian government assembly met for the first time, officially declaring independence. Augustin Voloshin was named head of state. In the first act, the state chose the blue and yellow Ukrainian flag and chose the song Ukraine has not perished as its national anthem. Voloshin sent a telegram to Germany asking them to take the Carpathian Ukraine under their protection. They received no response. By March 15th, the remaining Czechoslovakian units were fleeing. Hungary sent a messenger asking the Ruthenians to peacefully allow themselves to be annexed. Voloshin responded that Carpathia Ukraine is a peaceful state and wants to live in peace with its neighbors, but if necessary, will repel any aggressor. The Sitch recruited anyone they could find and with an irregular and poorly equipped force attempted to resist the invasion. Fighting was fiercest near the capital on the Red Field, where some 3,000 Sitch defended the capital. Hungarian sources claimed 230 Sitch were killed and 160 Hungarians. Polish forces also invaded from the north. By March 16th, the Carpathian government fled for Romania, and Hungary officially annexed the tiny country. One such soldier saw the newly appointed general of the army flee into Romania. The first to escape. The army is at war, he said, and the commander is fleeing. The New York Times reported of all the incredible episodes in the breakup of Czechoslovakia, what has happened during the last three days in Carpathia, Ukraine, is the most fantastic. On Tuesday, the smallest sector of the tripartite Czech state was fighting the Czechs. On Tuesday night, it proclaimed itself an independent state. On Wednesday morning, Czech flags were down, Czech troops in full flight, and Ukrainian colors were flying from every window in the capital. Hoost. By Wednesday afternoon, the Hungarian tricolors had replaced the Ukrainian blue and yellow. Carpatho Ukraine was actually under three flags in 27 hours. It would take several days to completely stamp out organized resistance, with the last holdouts in the mountains defeated by March 18th. A number of Sitch members would continue to fight as guerrilla units. 
Soldiers who had crossed into Ruthenia from Poland were handed over to the Poles. Many were executed. The weeks after the invasion were brutal as well, with as many as 27,000 people executed without trial. Every night for several days, it would take some of them out and kill them in the forest, wrote one observer. Tens of thousands fled to the USSR, where many would wind up in the Gulag. Many thousands more were forcibly deported by the Hungarians. There was a relatively large population of Jewish people in Ruthenia, most of whom would be killed in death camps after Germany occupied Hungary in 1944. Much of the world still believed that Hitler would use the idea of an independent Ukraine to begin his attack on the USSR. In London, a British diplomat warned the Soviet ambassador that Hitler would attack based on the liberation of Ukraine under the slogan of self-determination. Stalin see the situation differently, with Leo Trotsky writing that the transfer of Carpathian Ukraine to Hungary was clearly interpreted by Stalin as an act of peace. Stalin's notes say that Western concern about Ukraine was meant to poison the atmosphere and provoke a conflict with Germany for no apparent reason. Although ultimately futile, the struggle for Carpatho-Ukraine was illustrative of the complexity of that conflict, even in its earliest phases. Fear of the creation of an independent Ukrainian state was common among most of the interested parties in negotiating the political interest of the largest players seemed to be paramount above all else. Voloshin, the president of the One Day Republic, died in 1945 in Soviet custody, having been arrested and accused of being a Ukrainian nationalist. The official cause of death was listed as heart failure. Both Carpatho-Ukraine and Czechoslovakia found themselves without options, abandoned by allies and unable to defend themselves. But the, the, the defense of Carpatho-Ukraine, whether that is seen as a fight for an independent Ukrainian republic or just for a tiny Ruthenian state, was still significant. It represented some of the first organized armed resistance against the Axis powers in Europe. Come and join our community of people who believe that history deserves to be remembered at the historyguyguild.locals.com. This is Sparta! I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.